welcome to True Crime South Africa. I'm Nicole Engelbrecht, and you're listening to a full case bonus episode featuring one of the cases that's appeared on the Patreon feed in the past. If you listened to the wrap of 2023, you'll know about the two books I'm releasing this year. One of those books was due this week, which is why I haven't released an episode yet. So this is my plan for catching up. Today, I'm releasing an episode that was previously heard on the Patreon feed. It's a full case, so no corners cut. But you will have heard it before if you are a Patreon member. If you aren't a Patreon member, and you'd like to be, after you've listened to this episode, I strongly recommend you head over and sign up. Then you'll also have a brand new to everyone episode in your feed again this weekend. Everyone cool with that? Good. Glad to hear it. So, let's get into your full case bonus episode, The Murder of Inisha van Niekak. This episode is sponsored by the So What podcast. If I say Ruder Landmann, I'm pretty sure that for most South Africans, the carte blanche music and Sunday nights come to mind. For years, Ruda was, along with her colleagues at carte blanche, the source of hot topic reporting and important insights. And just because she's no longer on the show doesn't mean that incredible journalistic brain has stopped assessing the world in its unique way. Considering her husband, JP, is a political economic analyst, I'm pretty sure the big issue delving continues to this day in the Landmann home. Imagine what that dinner table conversation is like. Well, the Landmanns thought that their dinner table conversations were pretty interesting too. So they started recording them. And now, it's a podcast. Here's Ruda to tell you more about the So What podcast. Hello. I am Ruda Landmann, host of the So What podcast, in which political economic analyst JP Landmann takes a deep dive into one South African issue at a time. Whether it's load shedding, corruption, politics, economics, foreign policy, or anything in between, this is where you will find facts and insights to make informed decisions. The So What podcast, published monthly on all major platforms. The first 11 episodes were literally recorded around their dinner table, so you'll hear a little difference in the audio quality when they move into studio conditions. But the conversations and insights are incredible throughout. I highly recommend finding the So What podcast wherever you listen to True Crime South Africa and get that familiar voice back into your ears. A huge thank you to the So What podcast, for supporting True Crime South Africa. Since 2019, True Crime South Africa has been telling the stories of the victims of violent crime in South Africa. The podcast is independent. That means no big or even little corporates fund it. And that's just the way I like it. And it's the only independent podcast in South Africa that consistently charts in the top 10. Keeping a podcast like this going is time-consuming, and for the most part, it remains a one-woman process. It's me. I'm the one woman. You? Yes, you. Are the reason this podcast continues to flourish and help bring in tips on missing person and cold cases. If you'd like to help keep the show running, please consider supporting our sponsors, signing up to Patreon or PayPal, Follow the show on the socials, as the kids say, and share it with your fellow partners in crime. You can find our social links and learn more about our sponsors at True Crime South Africa forward slash donate. The following episode may contain sensitive material including descriptions of violence, sexual assault or graphic descriptions of injuries to victims. If you feel you may be triggered by such material, please consider this before accessing our content. To access trauma counselling or services, 
please see the helpline information on our show notes. Piecing together the past of the man who had become the perpetrator in this case is difficult. And for the most part, we have to do it by looking at the charges and complaints against him that would later come to light. Gerard Stephanus Williamson was born in 1964. We know almost nothing about his childhood and upbringing, and he first comes up on the radar in 1985. He'd married young, at 21, and his first wife was just 20. In 1985, Gerard first assaulted his wife. He would remain married to this woman for another 18 years, during which she endured continued violent assaults from the man. In 1986, his wife gave birth to their first daughter together. In 1988, Gerard was accused of sexually violating a six-year-old family member who was sleeping over at their house. That case was never brought to court, and it's unknown as to whether any criminal charges were laid against him. In the interests of maintaining the privacy of the victims, I'm going to be very vague about the identifying factors when I describe his sexual assault victims. In 1992, when another female family member turned six years old, he began to sexually violate her as well. And he would soon begin raping the child, which continued until that girl was 15 years old. Again, there seems to be no indication that these assaults and rapes were ever reported to police or investigated when they happened. We don't know whether the child had ever informed her caregivers of the incidents, but they did come up later on. The reason why these rapes may have stopped when the child was 15 is also unclear, but it's very possible that a separation in relationships may have prompted it, or the child may have simply become old enough that either Williamson was no longer sexually interested in her, or she herself threatened to go public if it didn't stop. In 1993, Williamson once again raped his first sexual assault victim, who was by then 11 years old. Three years later, he would finally stand in a courtroom to face a sexual assault charge when a nine-year-old girl from Moinoy accused the man of sexually assaulting her. Devastatingly, Williamson would be acquitted on this charge. Why this happened, or whether any of his history was presented in court, is unknown, but I cannot imagine the further traumatization of this young girl, who was brave enough to speak up, only to have her story not taken as truth, and her abuser was released to walk the streets again. As part of that same case, though, Williamson was found guilty of assault, in that he'd struck a 27-year-old woman with a fist in the face. The only conclusion I can draw, although admittedly I do so without proof, is that this woman may have been the child's mother or other caregiver, and when the sexual abuse of the child was revealed, the woman perhaps said she was going to the police, and Williamson struck her. For that charge, Williamson was sentenced to 80 days in jail, or a 400 rand fine. He paid the fine, and walked away. Williamson's relationships with women were almost always violent and abusive in many ways. He remained married to his first wife while he continued on relationships with other women. In 1998, he raped a woman with whom he was in a relationship. The woman never reported the rape, and I will not share her identity, but she did continue to see him for some time after this. Rape within the confines of a relationship is one of the most difficult for a victim to comprehend. Many still hold the mistaken belief that rape cannot occur within the confines of a relationship, and of course, that is entirely untrue. Consent for any sexual act cannot be assumed because a person has agreed to be in a relationship with you, and no person holds the rights to any sexual favor from their partner simply because they are married, engaged, or in a committed relationship. Marital rape was only actually officially made illegal in South Africa in the year 2000, when the Domestic Relations Act was passed, and it remains a topic that is deeply impacted by societal beliefs and religious stigma. <laughs>
when this rape is also part of a wider abusive pattern within the relationship, it becomes all the more difficult for a raped partner to come forward as coercion and control so deeply impact their decision-making processes. By the mid-90s, Williamson had become involved in a relationship with a woman who would become his second wife. Jane Fanikak was the same age as Williamson when she became involved with him, and she had a young daughter, Anisha. Anisha was in her early teens when her mother met and eventually married Gerard Williamson. And if you've been paying attention to this man's previous crimes, you might already be getting a sinking feeling in your gut. And yes, unfortunately that feeling is entirely warranted. Except that with Jane and her daughter Anisha, he would take his horrific actions further than he ever had before. One thing I'd like to point out before I go any further is a name issue that may be confusing to those of you who are familiar with other well-publicized South African crimes. This case was not very big in the media for various reasons, but there was another well-publicized case with a victim of the same name, Anisha Fanikak, and I don't want you to get the two confused, because I initially did in the beginning. I covered the murders of Anisha and Joey Fanikak in episode 78 of the True Crime South Africa podcast. So when I stumbled across this case, it took me a moment to realize that it wasn't the same instance. But indeed, these are two very different victims and two completely separate cases. Although we don't know how soon after their marriage, Gerard Williamson started becoming abusive and violent toward Anisha, with Jane, it started before they were even married. In 1999, Jane laid a charge of assault against Gerard after he punched her in the face at their home. As is so often the case with victims of domestic violence, Jane withdrew the case before it could make it to court. In 2000, Gerard's employer at the time brought charges against him for the fraudulent use of his company petrol card. This case was also withdrawn before it could make it to court. It appears that at some point around here, Gerard and Jane broke up for a short while, and he met and became engaged to another woman. But in 2001, that relationship ended very badly when the woman discovered that Gerard was sexually assaulting her six-year-old daughter. She did lay charges against him, and they did make it to court but devastatingly, Gerard was found not guilty. As part of this same case, Gerard was also charged with assaulting a minor child who he punched in the face. This child was the son of his fiancée at the time, and he held a gun to the head of his fiancée and threatened to shoot her. The latter two charges were withdrawn. Now, I don't have any details about all of these cases that were brought against Williamson, nor why certain charges were withdrawn and some charges were unsuccessful against him. Considering this man's significant history of aggression and threats, I can only think that a lot of this had to do with him threatening witnesses. It's honestly terrifying to me, though, that someone like this could constantly get away with what he was doing. In a very sad way, I can almost understand the sexual abuse against children charges failing because the successful prosecution rate on such cases is very low for various reasons. But how was he getting away with it when he was building such a significant history? He was literally abusing every single partner he was with, and he was with multiple women at once. And he wasn't just abusing them. He seemed to be purposefully selecting women who had young children, because almost all his partners had young female children who would go on to be abused and sexually assaulted by Williamson. It's just horrific. There's no other word for it. The extensive nature of this man's relationships is also quite shocking. He was not an unattractive man, but he certainly wasn't exceedingly good-looking but we know that often abusive people like this 
are also very manipulative, charming, and fun to be around, at least in the beginning. They know exactly how to love bomb and gaslight people right into their nets. And clearly, Gerard Williamson was very good at that. By 2003, he was engaged to yet another woman, and again, that relationship ended with him raping that woman's 16-year-old daughter. That case was withdrawn. Later in that same year, Williamson had an altercation with his first wife and his own son, which turned violent. He was charged with assaulting both of them and found guilty. His penalty? A 500 rand admission of guilt fine. I cannot help but think that all of these cases being withdrawn and when he was found guilty, these pathetic sentences would only have served to embolden this criminal. He would likely have felt that he was being given permission to go right ahead and do exactly as he pleased, or even escalate. And that's exactly what he did. Over the next four years, Gerard and Jane rekindled their relationship on and off, and in 2007, he was living with Jane in her home in Kempton Park. Her daughter, Anisha, who was by then 22, had moved to Cape Town to live with her father, but would fly up occasionally to visit her mother and older sister. We don't know for sure what the relationship between Gerard and Anisha was like as stepfather and stepdaughter, It seemed to be one that swung between Anisha tolerating the man for her mother's sake and them getting into rip-roaring fights. In September 2007, Anisha was visiting her mother when an incident is recorded between her and Gerard, during which Anisha had gone to sleep in her bedroom and, seemingly still simmering over an unresolved dispute, Gerard had gone into her room and punched her while she slept. This incident was not reported to police. Toward November of that year, Anisha arrived back in Kempton Park from Cape Town. This time, she was there for her sister's wedding, which was to take place at the end of that month. Anisha wanted to be able to assist with the last-minute planning and join in the festivities, so she'd arrived a week or so earlier. On Saturday the 24th of November, Anisha's sister's bachelorette party was held at a friend of the sister's in Glenmarie. Anisha spent the night there. On Sunday the 25th of November 2007, Gerard invited Jane and Anisha to go out to lunch at a local restaurant. Gerard wanted to go on his motorbike, but Jane didn't like riding on it, so Anisha said she would go with him and her mother could drive the car there. Anisha enjoyed Gerard's motorbike and would often ride with him when they were on good terms and she was visiting her mom. The three left the house, met up at the restaurant and proceeded to have lunch. Afterwards, they headed back home. Anisha and Gerard on the motorcycle and Jane in her car. When Jane arrived home, she was surprised to find that her husband and daughter weren't back yet. The bike was a much faster mode of transport than her car, and she'd expected them to be back home long before her. she just started to get worried that they may have been in an accident when she heard the bike idling in the driveway. Jane went out and found that only Gerard was on the bike. She asked where Anisha was, and he said that the young woman had asked to be dropped off at a friend's house. Jane was confused, as Anisha hadn't mentioned anything about going to a friend, but at 22, Anisha could do what she liked, so Jane thought nothing more of it. As the day wore on, though, she heard nothing from her daughter, and then night fell, and the young woman still wasn't home. Something started to niggle at Jane. Anisha hadn't taken any of her belongings with her when they went for lunch, She didn't have any bank cards or money or even her cell phone. It was all still sitting in the guest room, and Jane began to worry that if something happened, her daughter would have no way of getting back to the house. Jane raised these concerns with Gerard, 
who dismissed them, telling her that Anisha was an adult and she could take care of herself. Jane asked Gerard where he dropped Anisha off, and he said she'd asked him to pull over at the corner of two streets in Glenmarie, Kempton Park. He'd done so, she'd gotten off, given her helmet back, and walked away. The street corner was about two blocks away from the friend's house that she'd been at the night before. Jane was now a little annoyed that her husband hadn't even bothered to ensure her daughter had gotten safely into her friend's house, but she was likely not willing to stir up Gerard's temper either, so she let it go for the time being. Later that evening, Jane called the friend who she believed Anisha was with and asked to speak to her daughter. The woman said Anisha wasn't there, and she hadn't seen her since Saturday. Now, Jane was utterly confused. Who else could Anisha have been headed to if she wasn't going to that house? After a few more phone calls to friends and family members, no one had seen Anisha and a growing sense of unease was building in the mother. Jane slept fitfully that night, constantly waking up when she heard noises she thought might be Anisha returning home. At one point, she fell into a deeper sleep for a while and woke to the headlights of a vehicle and the sound of Gerard's 4x4 Bucky engine being turned off in the driveway. When he came into the bedroom, he seemed annoyed to see her awake. Jane asked him where he'd been, and he said he'd gone to look for Anisha because he was also worried about her. Jane accepted this, but found it impossible to fall asleep again that night. Instead, she whiled away the hours, having already decided to report her daughter missing as soon as daylight broke. On the morning of Monday the 26th of November, Despite Gerard telling her that she was acting crazy and there was no need to jump to conclusions, Jane got in her car and drove to the police station in Kempton Park. There, she reported her daughter as missing. The missing persons case was assigned to Inspector Figizolo, and Anisha's photograph was circulated to local missing person organisations, including the Pink Ladies, who created and distributed flyers in an attempt to locate the young woman. Now, we don't have much information about this part of the investigation, and there may well have been a fast and thorough search done for the young woman, but from what I've seen in other cases where people in their teens or early 20s go missing, the immediate thought is that they're out partying and they'll be back. And I can't see that police would have thought any difference about Anisha. Her stepfather had said she'd gone to see friends. She was in Kempton Park from Cape Town and likely hadn't seen her friends for some time, so it may have been fair for police to assume that she'd gotten caught up in the celebrations of reunion and forgotten to let her mom know. That may have been plausible, at least for the first day or so. But Jane knew better. She didn't believe that her daughter would abandon all the plans she'd made with her sister for her wedding preparations. What made it worse was that they'd been unable to identify any other friends that Anisha might have had living in the Glenmarie area. Why would she have asked to be dropped off on a street corner and not at a house? In checking her cell phone, it also didn't appear that she'd had any communications with, with anyone in Kempton Park since she'd arrived, so why would she randomly pitch up at someone's house on a Sunday afternoon? It just didn't make sense. As the days started to pass without any word from Anisha, all her mother could hope was that the young woman would at least arrive at her sister's wedding. If she'd gone off on some uncharacteristic bender, everyone knew that she would not miss the wedding for anything in the world. As the 1st of December and the wedding day arrived, everyone held their breath in anticipation of Anisha's arrival. She would come rushing through the door, muttering apologies, looking as beautiful as ever, and ask if her dress was there. But the ceremony came and went, and then the reception. 
and there was no sign of Anisha. What should have been one of the most joyous days of her sister's life was now marred by the knowledge that Anisha was not okay, because if she was, she would have been there. Two days later, on the 3rd of December 2007, a man walking on the side of the Bapsfontein Bronkhorstbreit Road made a grisly discovery. The body of a female was found lying metres from the road's edge. When police arrived at the scene, they found the severely decomposed woman lying on her stomach. Her arms were outstretched above her head, and she was nude except for a shirt which had been pulled up over her breasts. When forensics teams arrived, the first thing they noticed was that there was no sign of blood at the scene, despite the woman having a significant head injury. The murder didn't appear to have taken place at that location. There was no form of identification on or near the body, and due to the severe head injury which had resulted in parts of the skull being crushed, facial identification was going to be impossible. This left investigators with two options, fingerprints and DNA. Taking fingerprints from a severely decomposed body is a very difficult task, but not impossible. What makes it difficult is the skin slippage that starts to occur as a result of decomposition. This is when the top layers of the skin start to break away from the tissue underneath, and it makes handling a decomposed body very difficult too. It is the same skin slippage process though, that when handled carefully, can help investigators to still use the unique ridges and walls on the fingers of a deceased person to identify them. What happens in this case is that on the autopsy table, the skin from the victim's fingers will be very carefully incised and slid off each of the finger bones. Then, someone with gloved hands will roll that skin onto their own fingers, over their gloves, and if all goes well, you have reconstituted the deceased person's fingerprints. In some way, bringing them back to life, for just a moment, so that they can play a role in reclaiming their own identity. Investigating a murder in which the deceased is unidentified is notoriously difficult. In fact, for the most part, such cases are only solved when they're part of a series that can be identified and similar fact evidence can be used to prove that all victims, regardless of whether identity is known or not, were killed by the same individual. It is for this reason that investigators knew that if they wanted to find out who had caused this woman to be laying deceased in the bushes, they would have to first find her name. This is also vitally important, because murders are so often committed by someone known to the individual, so an unidentified victim essentially means the pool of suspects is anyone in the province at the time clearly not viable for solving crimes. The way the woman's body had been left nude from the waist down and with her shirt pushed up over her breasts clearly told investigators that there was a sexual motive to this murder. Another clue discovered at the scene was a pair of Ray-Ban sunglasses which was lying in the dirt less than a metre from the body. Of course, one of the first things to check was any missing person reports that had been filed which might match the description of the body they'd found. At that point, they were able to tell from a small amount of hair left on the body that it was a white female, and they could estimate her age range to a pretty wide bracket. The most likely match to this description was a missing persons report filed on the 26th of November for Anisha Fanikak. Anisha's description matched what could still be seen of the body's features, in terms of race and age, and the clothing she was last seen wearing also matched the shirt found on the body, although that too was badly damaged from being out in the elements and exposed to bodily fluids for 10 days. Investigators requested Anisha's fingerprints from Home Affairs records and compared them to the fingerprints obtained from the body by the method I described earlier.
At the same time, a femur bone from the body was removed and sent to the lab for DNA extraction. If the fingerprints matched closely enough, DNA would be the final box check in identification. Sadly, the fingerprints were a match, and on the 7th of December, Jane Williamson was advised that the body of her daughter had been discovered and identified. Anisha had been murdered. From the condition of the body, the pathologist was able to determine that Anisha had very likely died on the same day she disappeared or very close to it. After informing the mother of the heartbreaking news and with Anisha's missing person case now a murder investigation, detectives asked permission to search the house for evidence. Jane agreed. Of course, she knew her daughter had not come to any harm in her home. All the while, Gerard Williamson sat beside his wife, rubbing her shoulder, consoling her. He couldn't believe it, he said. Not Anisha. She'd been like a daughter to him. After providing a statement to investigators about what had happened on the day of Anisha's disappearance, police asked Gerard to hand over the helmet and jacket that Anisha had been wearing on the motorbike the day she went missing. He duly did so, and police took this as well as a few of the girls' personal items that remained at the house with them. The next few weeks would be a flurry of activity in the investigation, as dual legs of the investigation looked into the possibility that the last person to see her alive, Gerard Williamson, could be the suspect, but at the same time, the possibility she'd indeed been dropped off in Glen Marais could not be discounted entirely. So until the evidence started to point wholly in one direction or another, both options had to be kept open. When detectives started to chat to people about Gerard Williamson, though, alarm bells began to go off. This is when his history of violence and sexual assault started to emerge, both the reported and the unreported cases. Pretty early on in the investigation, the investigating officer had asked for the assistance of the investigative psychology unit. Lieutenant Colonel Jan de Lange was appointed to assist as he had significant experience in investigating sexually motivated crimes. When de Lange looked at Williamson's history, a picture started to form in his mind. This man was a serial offender. Despite never having been found guilty of a sexual crime, the long list of complaints against him could not be ignored. These victims were not making up their accounts, certainly not so many of them, and with such regularity and similar modus operandi. Williamson, it appeared, had gone through his entire adult life targeting the female children of his partners, as well as other young family members. Anisha, despite being older than most of his victims, certainly fit his victim profile. Unfortunately, Due to the advanced decomposition, no testable DNA was found during a rape kit performed on Anisha's body, but detectives thought if they could find enough other evidence, they wouldn't need Williamson's DNA in Anisha's body to prove this murder. The Ray-Ban sunglasses found at the scene would soon prove to be vital when police searched Williamson's phone and found a photograph he'd asked Jane to take of him while he was driving. In the picture, he was wearing Ray-Ban sunglasses. When they questioned Jane Williamson, she said that her husband had owned sunglasses like the one they'd showed her in the evidence packet, and that she hadn't seen them since Anisha had disappeared. In some really great detective work, Police were able to use facial recognition technology software to compare the sunglasses they'd found at the scene to the ones in the photograph of Gerard Williamson. Using several distinct characteristics of the sunglasses in question, police were able to conclusively show that these were the same sunglasses that Williamson had owned. Then came the final nail in Williamson's coffin. On the 25th of February 2008, investigators received news that blood found inside the visor screw of the helmet 
which Anisha had been wearing when she disappeared, was a match to her blood. This was more than enough evidence to arrest Gerard Williamson for the murder of his stepdaughter Anisha. And later that day, that is exactly what happened. Jane Williamson had not wanted to believe that her husband could be responsible for the murder of her daughter. She tried to explain away the evidence that seemed to be mounting against him, but on that day, as he was handcuffed in her home and led away, she could no longer deny the truth. For the first few days after his arrest, Gerard Williamson refused to speak to police, except to insist that he was innocent. But late on the 27th of February, Williamson asked to speak to the investigating officer. He would go on to deliver a confession of the following events. Williamson said that on Sunday, when Anisha had disappeared, they'd been riding home on the motorbike when he'd pulled over on the side of the road and killed Anisha in a nearby stretch of felt. He gave no reason for killing her and refused to admit any sexual motive to his crime. He said he'd hit Anisha in the head with a large rock until she was dead. Anisha's skull had been sent to the University of Pretoria for reconstruction due to the extensive fractures she'd sustained and the nature of injuries lined up with multiple blunt force blows from an object such as a rock. He said that he dragged her body into some bushes and then gone home to Jane. He confirmed that that night, when Jane had said he'd woken up and gone out, and he'd claimed he'd been looking for Anisha, he'd actually gone back to collect her body and deposit it in an area closer to Glenmarie to try and match up with his story. He didn't want her body to be found on the route he would have taken home from the restaurant. He dumped Anisha's body in the spot where it was later found. He claimed that she'd been fully clothed when he'd left her there, but he'd gone back a few days after he'd killed her and retrieved her clothing, which he'd then burned in a bry at Jane's home. The next day, Williamson, accompanied by a detective not linked to the case, had pointed out all of the scenes related to the murder and signed a confession in front of a magistrate. Jane Williamson was informed that her husband had confessed to the murder, and she broke down and had to be hospitalised. Detectives were grateful that they would now be able to secure justice for Anisha, and with the wealth of evidence, even if Gerard eventually ended up retracting his confession, as so many do, they would undoubtedly still be able to prove his guilt in a court of law. But Gerard Williamson had decided otherwise. On the morning of the 29th of February 2008, police officials and the holding cell cook walked into the holding cells at Valbekent Police Station to serve those being held there their breakfast. They found Gerard Williamson hanging from the bars on his window. He was dead. Williamson had torn a handle from a sports bag that was in the cell with him, climbed up onto the bed, used a pile of blankets to stand on, tied the end of the handle to the bars on the window, and ended his life. Anisha's family was given the news later that day. They would never see justice done for Anisha, but they also did not have to sit through a trial and one day fight Williamson's parole. It's frustrating to think that Gerard Williamson could have been stopped before he escalated to murder, but honestly, this is not an uncommon situation. The world over these types of habitually violent offenders will go through their entire lives assaulting and abusing and either continually get themselves out of these situations or for whatever reason, the law doesn't catch up with them. But even if Williamson had been found guilty on one of the sexual abuse charges against him, it's unlikely he would have seen any significant jail sentence for his early crimes. In the UK, they've acknowledged that a person's history of complaints must be taken into account by police officers when assessing the risk of a domestic violence situation. But this is a discretionary policy, and still, to this day, 
people like Gerard Williamson continue to commit crimes around the world because cases are viewed in isolation rather than with the history behind it. As far as we know, this is the first time Williamson committed murder. I don't think there is any doubt that he raped Anisha and that her death was a direct result of this. She was far older and more likely to fight back, and also to be believed if she went to police. But this was not a crime of desperation. Williamson was extremely calculated about how he carried out this crime, and he had to have known that Anisha would not give in to his advances when he pulled over on the side of the road that day. I don't know exactly what was going through his head, but maybe he planned to kill her all along. His partial confession, in my opinion, was a slap in the face. He may have at least provided confirmation to his still disbelieving wife, but he didn't have the courage to say why, nor to admit that he'd raped Anisha. So now her mother and siblings have to live with not understanding what was going through this man's head when he did this terrible thing. I'm never one to call suicide cowardly. I don't believe in other situations it is that at all. I believe the act of ending one's own life is often the only course of action a person sees as right for them at that time. In this case, though, Williamson knew very well that he was exposed. His run as an untouched sex offender and abuser was over, and rather than face the consequences and his victim's family in a court of law and risk having his entire history presented to the public, he decided he was going to take that one last act of control and exit on his own terms. Anisha Fanikak was an absolutely gorgeous young woman. Her smiling face beams out from photographs, and you can almost hear her laughter echoing from that moment in time. There are many survivors of Williamson's crimes. One woman commented on a blog post that the man had raped her when she was a child. She said that her mother knew about the rape and did nothing to protect her. Silence within families about sexual abuse is a dangerous thing. Often a child will be unable to speak about the abuse they've endured because of the grooming process. But just as often they do speak up, and the family decides it's better to deal with the matter without police. Often they will make it the responsibility of the children in the family to protect themselves. Don't be alone in the same room with uncle so-and-so, okay? That woman that commented on that blog felt betrayed. She felt like, as a small child, she was put in the position of protecting herself against a predator. And I have no doubt that she considered the fact that if circumstances had been just slightly different, she too may have lost her life. Perhaps in a way... It's fitting that Kerat Williamson has been removed from society permanently. At the very least, he can't hurt anyone else. For Anisha, though, that came too late. Domestic violence doesn't always look like a battered and bruised partner. As we've seen in far too many cases, very often domestic violence is turned on the family of the partner, including their children. Really, there's no simple solution to this, except to say that as family members of survivors of sexual abuse and domestic violence, we cannot remain silent. We cannot allow our families to protect offenders by conceding to the we'll handle this inside the family idea. Because when you handle it inside the family, people continue to be abused, and sometimes innocent people die. Of course, there were those who went outside of the family and reported the crimes committed against them, and they were let down by the system. So you never really know which way it's going to go. But one thing is for sure. Silence protects predators, not victims. Rest gently, Anisha. Anisha. 
If you'd like to hear more victim-focused true crime content, please subscribe to True Crime South Africa on Spotify or the platform you're using to listen right now. If you're looking for something still related to real-life stories, but often with a more positive slant, you can check out my new podcast series, I Live Through This. You can follow both podcasts on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I'll be back next week with another episode. Until then, thank you for your support, and I'll chat to you soon.